where's music going? I feel like I don't know where else it can go. Maybe is more of what I am unsure about. <laughs> so I disagree okay. with the narrative. Okay. So this is still taught in many... Uh, they're working to get this out, but music history in general is taught in a very modernist mm. linear narrative. Sure. It's basically like a biblical yeah. Bach begat mm. Mozart begat Beethoven begat sure. Brahms. Yeah. There's this like unending linear line mm. of old white European dudes mm. going... <laughs> somewhere towards better music. Mm. So that is based on a racist anthropological theory that was <laughs> really big in like the 19th century and the early 20th century. Mm. That was this idea of societies all progressed from primitivism mm. to barbarianism to civilization. Mm. And so they actually believed mm -hmm. if you found a group of indigenous people who had certain attributes, like they didn't have a city mm. or they didn't have specialized labor that fit the European model of what specialized <laughs> labor looks like, mm. then you were literally looking into the past of European cultures. Mm -hmm. Like they actually believed this is so wrong. Mm. Like it's just not yeah. correct. Let alone that it's racist, it's also just incorrect. Mm. But they literally believed like, I'm looking into the past of how we used to be. Mm -hmm. So if we left them alone for 10,000 years, we would come back and it would be Vienna. Sure. Like, <laughs> that was the actual anthropological theory. Mm -hmm. And the thing with anthropological and sociological and philosophical theories mm -hmm. is they infect all of the other mm -hmm. um, fields of study mm -hmm. But they do so in a very, like I'm using infect, which is a really loaded term. <laughs> like the roots go in deep and then it's hard to get rid of them because it's rare that you actually take a far enough step back mm. to observe like, sure. why do we teach it this way? Mm -hmm. And so that is the narrative of music history. Mm -hmm. And it's the narrative of popular music history too a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know... You know, the pop of the time became, you know, the the like um, African-American girl rock of like the Shrells and everything, then became the British invasion, then mm -hmm. became the psychedelic music movement, yeah. you know, then became the punk, punk movement. Like there's this like, yeah, yeah. we like teaching things in this kind of linear, linear historical mm. progression. It also makes it easier to tell because it's a story and it's a simple like story. story. <laughs> um but the, the narrative with all of those is that it needs to be going to something. Mm -hmm. Like this is leading to something. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that's the way that artistic mm -hmm. movements work. I don't think that's the way that anything in human history works. Mm. Um, I haven't made this joke in a while, but I used to make the joke that like, if there's one thing that you learn from getting a bachelor's degree, mm. it's that people were just as smart as you in every era of history. Mm. Like, You'll read, like, if you read Chaucer, like, he is freaking, like, Chappelle from the 12th century <laughs> or whatever century he's from. Like, mm. he is, like, it's dirty and it's funny and mm. it's, you know. Yeah. Um, there is this narrative of how people see medieval art compared to Renaissance art mm -hmm. that, like, somehow it's like, you know, oh, there's this, like, the babies always look like old men and the faces are always weird looking mm. and like it's because they didn't know how to paint. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was that the medieval time period was much more involved with like symbolism mm. and like what we consider like 1950s avant-garde stuff about mm -hmm. like not representationism but like super weird like using shapes and numerology to create. Mm -hmm. thing. Like medieval art is really hip mm -hmm. and then some renaissance art is like that's just a bowl of fruit that looks like a bowl of fruit. Mm -hmm. And yet the narrative yeah. is that they European got art got painting. better. Yeah. And that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Like the whole thing about like, have you seen the little ugly baby heads? Mm -hmm. So like, I don't, do you know the backstory behind those? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think you've talked about it that like Jesus was born as the like fully grown, fully man. grown man because he was 
God and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. so he's this full grown man, but he was also a baby. Yes. So, he so he's looks, a baby yeah. that has like a very <laughs> harshly receding hairline mm. and it is super creepy looking, <laughs> but it's cool. It's like, it's so, and there's like the like weird yeah, angles he's, he's of the always backgrounds. doing this thing yeah the, with the hand the, which now you get punched for uh, right <laughs> and the halos it like it's just a cool so once you throw away the idea that art gets better mm. you start to go what have we missed in the narrative mm -hmm. um so one of the big projects right now that's happening with classical music mm -hmm. is they're rewriting the narrative of American classical music to mm. include diverse peoples. It's mm -hmm. so like with the Fort Smith Symphony, we just recorded Florence Price's first and fourth symphonies. Mm. First African American woman to have a piece played by a major symphony. She got mm. premiered by Chicago Symphony a like hundred years ago. Like mm -hmm. uh, the pieces are great. Mm -hmm. Like so, the thing that people always say that's like against this, like it just sounds like Dvorak but a little different. Mm -hmm. And it's like it sounds better than a lot of Dvorak stuff. Like if you've mm. listened to his early symphonies, like mm. it's, they're better symphonies. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that's happening with classical music is this rewriting of it to include diversity as part of it. Cause mm. a lot of times those people were like really influential at mm. the time, but they're not part of our, this person begat that person begat yeah. that person. Um, so we're actually working on a project right now. So Christina discovered a this is what she's doing her second dissertation on <laughs> um we joke that like so she's almost she hasn't done her generals again so here's a dma <laughs> she's getting a phd in sociocultural anthropology <laughs> and linguistics um she's finished all her classes for the second time and mm -hmm. i was joking last week that she has discovered a hitherto unknown form of senioritis <laughs> that involves getting a doctorate all like going all the way through and then going back and getting another master's and another doctorate. <laughs> um, but so this fell in her lap. So there is, uh, she got a call this summer from Matt Stock, who's a librarian at OU School of Music Library. Mm. Um, he's a friend of ours. He said, hey, we're clearing out the attic. We found all these boxes. We're mm. about to throw them out. Can you come take a look at them? Make sure it's not something you want. Yeah. So she goes up. She recognizes the name. She says, can you give me a week? I need to do some research. Don't throw these out. It's like 30 boxes of all of the handwritten manuscripts of um, Jack Frederick Kilpatrick, who is, as far as we can tell, the first Native American professional composer. Wow. He was chair of the School of Music at SMU in the 50s, mm -hmm. wrote like 10 symphonies, got stuff played by Dallas and OKC. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, he is the first Native American professional classical composer. Yeah. No one knows who he is. Mm -hmm. He has all this music. So we're doing a thing with the OKC Phil where they're going to play a piece of his mm. on the first concert. And then uh, Christina and I are helping put together. Um, it's kind of like a grand entry. So we're using John mm. Hamilton, who's a great artist, and Tim Nevaquia is going to play <laughs> flute. And we're just writing kind of the orchestra parts to make it like fit together mm. of their music. Um, that changes the narrative. Mm -hmm. So like there's this narrative of and this is in right now in classical music. Like mm. the Florence Price thing, we got write-ups in the New Yorker and Wall Street Journal. Like mm. it's, it is the thing right now <laughs> is to rediscover the diversity present mm. in like the history of yeah. that art medium. Mm. So the other thing that this is, I know this is going kind of far afield. No, you're fine. Um, <laughs> but it's like, what is the future of art? So <laughs> the... Other thing with the narrative is that the only time I think you can really have an avant-garde mm. is if you have a very stringent artistic society that you can... So the avant-garde means you're on the edge of, right? Yeah. You are the avant-garde. You are the, yeah. like, almost falling off the edge of how far away you can be from the thing. Mm -hmm. In order to have that, there needs to be pushback against it. Mm -hmm. So, like, modern dance is a reaction to ballet. Mm -hmm. So modern dance was about, like, being the antithesis of ballet. Mm -hmm. Like ballet yeah. is all about being up and being as tall as possible and being mm -hmm. on point. So modern dance is going to be, you know, this is old. This is like the 20s or 30s. Sure, sure. Modern dance is going to be like you're crawling on the floor because mm -hmm. it's the opposite of it. Mm -hmm. Like ballet, you're going to be in these pink tutus and you're going to be doing all this. So modern dance, you're going to be wearing all black. Mm -hmm. 
ballet is supposed to be beautiful. Modern dance will be about being ugly. Mm -hmm. But it's still dance with no words, done by professionals, on a stage, to music. Mm -hmm. Usually classical. Mm -hmm. So when you rev like when you have an artistic revolution against something, mm -hmm. it's about the thing you're having the artistic revolution against. Yeah. So I think what a lot of people are um, uh, kind of paralyzed by artistically mm. is like I didn't have a thing to fight against. Mm. Like my composition teacher didn't make me write total serialism mm -hmm. like his teachers did. Yeah. So I'm not able to be Terry Riley and write in C as my master's thesis as mm -hmm. a big F you yeah. to serialism. So yeah. like, I'm going to write a piece called in C that is all in C mm -hmm. because the entire basis of the system you've been teaching me is about not writing something in C major. Yeah. I wrote a serialist percussion piece because I wanted to. Yeah. I didn't really want to, but I did. <laughs> right. Well, and it's like, I use serialism a lot. Like, mm -hmm. I actually think it's... So the basis of it, even though Schoenberg likes to talk about, like, he is the modernist, like, mm. in a hundred years, everyone will listen to serialism because <laughs> we have babies who, like, haven't been raised on tonality. Mm. That did not happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, the whole modernist thing kind of fell apart with World War One and World War Two, mm. because, like, Europe pre-World War One was actually not bad mm. like it was there's these like things about living in paris at that time before it got smacked by two world wars and it mm. was like this gem yeah and like there were issues but like actually at that time like a lot of things that we think of as like socially progressive things mm. had happened in a lot of those places before the war started <laughs> so like there's this assumption that things are always getting better mm. and it's not necessarily true mm. So with art, I don't think anyone who is part of those things mm. ever really feels like, I don't think you should know what's next. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think like, so Christina and I were literally talking about this with Rachmaninoff. So one of the things that people mm -hmm. give Rachmaninoff crap for mm. is that like, you know, oh, you know, he just wished he'd been born 50 years earlier. His stuff's all, like, romantic, and it's, you know, mm. he might as well have been Tchaikovsky, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. His stuff doesn't sound anything like Tchaikovsky. Mm. It sounds way, he's doing things rhythmically that you would never see in those earlier works. Mm. It's just that the tonal language itself mm. is not the area that he's necessary. So, like, classical music has been so obsessed with what your pitch content is. Mm -hmm. It's like pitch content is what defines... Yeah. Whether you're progressing forward. And for a long time, it was like, if it's not more dissonant than the music that came before it, then somehow you're not <laughs> progressing. And to me, that's like, if you look at history, those are normal progressions that happen within mm -hmm. a group. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, as to what next, what's next is what it's always been. There's going to be a bunch of artists making stuff. Mm -hmm. And some of it will resonate with society mm -hmm. and some of it like won't catch on. And yeah. some of it might catch on way after. So like Bach was also a revivalist movement. Mm -hmm. So like Bach wasn't big until Mendelssohn, who was a conductor, mm -hmm. started doing Bach festivals saying like, mm -hmm. you all need to listen to this guy. This guy was a genius. Yeah. Like, I know you all know, like Johann Christian Bach was always more famous than Johann Sebastian Bach. Mm -hmm. His, I mean, he kind of invented the classical period, mm -hmm. but like that is not the narrative anymore. It's mm -hmm. like half, most people don't even know who Johann Christian Bach is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interest. Like I think that's not that's not what creates art. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> creating art is just you make something mm -hmm. and then you make something else. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's like don't. I don't think it is a effective endeavor mm -hmm. to worry about sure. whether I think you can take steps to try and become more famous or take steps <laughs> towards trying to like 
But I think the only way I do new stuff is to do stuff that's new and hard for you. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's the... Yeah. Um, so like for me, this octet has yeah. been incredibly hard for mm -hmm. me to write because I'm not trying to write something I've written before. Mm -hmm. um, so there are sections where like... So I have one section where I did something that... So did you read the Instagram post I did where I was like trying to do the GRM shuffle and the delay? Mm -hmm. So GRM shuffle, it wasn't like, this wasn't the, that's how I described it to myself after I did it. <laughs> um, so this is what I'm kind of talking about with going, I, I go back and forth between my left brain and my right brain on the same <laughs> piece over and over again. Um, so the way shuffle works is it takes something and then it like plays it back as if it's like the same thing as on four Mm -hmm. tapes and it's playing them back at different speeds and shuffling mm -hmm. where they start mm -hmm. so you get this kind of effect of like I'm wiggling my fingers which you cannot see on this yes. podcast because there <laughs> aren't, aren't cameras um, but it's like they sort of almost like people who are running a race change like who's in the lead and who's in the back it's mm -hmm. like people on a racetrack yeah. doing like four people on a racetrack <laughs> doing a run and it's like mm -hmm. at different times they're at different distances from each other mm -hmm. So, like, to me, one of the things that I tend to do a lot in my pieces, which is, again, this is something that, like, this is only me realizing this after seeing myself do it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Being like, oh, I kind of do this thing, is I like to take verticalities mm -hmm. and make them horizontal and take horizontal writing and make it vertical. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, it's based off of a hymn, mm -hmm. which is incredibly horizontal. It's like these horizontal mm. parts. And it's not terribly polyphonic. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a little bit of counterpoint. And it's cool counterpoint, mm -hmm. but, you know. And so what I did is I took my violin and I looked at the music. And I said, how would it sound if I read each line, but I played it as eighth notes rather than the rhythms that are written? Mm -hmm. And I never repeated a note twice. So if a note repeats three times, I'm going to mm -hmm. skip to the next note. Mm -hmm. So like instead of ba da 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 ba da dum ba da da dum it goes ba da 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 like any time it repeats you just go to the next note this is this is like again it's kind of an algorithmic way of composing yeah cuz i was like what is that but counterpoint i'm just taking like what is a very tight counterpoint and kind of like changing mm -hmm. i'm shuffling the positions that they're at and because of that they're going to change where they are with each other mm -hmm. and then i read each I, I did the first line and i it turned into like a four bar mm -hmm. phrase that repeats each time the second line i just read and kind of improv it over it but i'm reading it mm -hmm. and then the third line i did the same thing mm -hmm. and then like after it runs for about two minutes i just started improv one of the lines because i wanted <laughs> it to sound bigger mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's, like, new. Mm -hmm. I've never done it before. I'm sure, sure other people have. Sure. But, like, I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. And it sounds, like, awesome. I yeah. am super pumped about this part. <laughs> and then I have the uh, clarinets are playing the, the melody, but they're doing it, like, in this weird, like, mm -hmm. there are just many meters happening. <laughs> and people are in different spots. And it's going to be really easy to put together. It's mm -hmm. going to be, like... No problem put together. Hmm. But when you listen to it, like, you cannot figure out what the bar line is. Mm. Like, the bar line is just gone. Mm. Yeah. That's <laughs> new. Yeah. I'm not saying other people haven't done it or that people mm -hmm. won't listen to it and be like, oh, whatever. It sounds like different trains or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. But, like, that's how you come up with new stuff. Mm -hmm. is you just try stuff. You try stuff. And then, again, like, you, you lean into your own stuff. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of see how far your own stuff is going to take you. Mm. And then I think you explore what other people are doing too. And you're mm. like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll try something like that. But like, I'm not going to do it right. I'm yeah. not going to be able to do it the way they did it. Yeah. So by me doing something, I guess that's what... Um, so like, I'm not sure how you're going to cut these up, but... No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> when like... There is a certain type of music that I can tell they are writing visually. And by that, I mean like 
they looked at a score and they copied what the score was doing, which mm -hmm. will give you the same sound sure. as that score. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, it's what a lot of film music does because like you need, you need to choose the right thing for the scene. And so mm -hmm. if you know what the right thing for the scene is, you don't try and recreate the mm -hmm. wheel because there's too many like agents there to try yeah. and fit it in. You do a thing that you know is going to work for that scene, mm -hmm. which is itself a craft and an art form. Yeah. When you're trying to create new music, mm -hmm. you don't want, in my opinion, yeah. to have too much control over it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like if you are too in control of what you're doing, mm -hmm. for me, everybody's different with this, but for me, like, It's I, I start with a concept and I get mm -hmm. into the concept and then I let myself at some point be loose from the concept and just do what the piece wants to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue with that is then you tend to do you. Like, all of my pieces have a part that is unmetered that, like, mm -hmm. there's kind of a call and response thing between the people and mm -hmm. it does this gesture. And I love it. Yeah. But I'm like, I kind of put it in the same spot of every piece. Mm -hmm. It's like, right in this nice middle section... Mm -hmm tends to be there. <laughs> um, but it's like that leaning in to it, Yeah, I think is, that's how you get something new, mm. is by like having so many things in the pot yeah. and just putting the time in with the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think. I think people miss out on it. So like, People always think artistic. So, like, there's a meme that goes around that's like, someone's like, How'd you get so good at drawing? It's like, Practice. Mm -hmm. it's like, but, like, you must have been given talent. Nope, it's just practice. It's like, Oh, you're so talented. I wish mm -hmm. I could do that. You could just practice. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, Yeah. <laughs> it's this Hemingway thing of like, you only see the t tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. This is a literary thing that I've always heard of like, mm -hmm. your audience doesn't need to know what the life story... You don't need to tell your audience the life story of every character, mm -hmm. but you should know it because yeah. it will affect how the characters act. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a reason that's like, this character acted this way because they had this traumatic thing happen in their childhood, mm -hmm. and therefore, when this person did this, <laughs> they reacted that way, you never have to mention the reason. Mm -hmm. But like... Like it happens in TV shows a lot when they get new writers <laughs> is the characters will do something that that character wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And you go like, okay, you didn't understand yeah. the character. Um, like when they did the, the remake of Community, mm. like it's like they watched the pilot and uh. based all the characters after that. <laughs> but like all the characters had had three seasons of growth, yeah. which then they went like, they reverted back to their like episode one characters. Yeah. Um, so for music, one thing that I always try and do mm -hmm. is that there is, I have thought about it at every level. Mm -hmm. So like, if you want to get deep into the like <laughs> weeds of the theory and what I'm doing and how the stuff acts and why these chords are the way they are, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I can talk about how like the way I got these sounds was by stacking perfect fifths on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but like. If you read it as a minor nine add four chord without the three, that's also correct. But that's not how I got to it. Sure. You know? Yeah. And so for me, it's like if you spend the time to mm. put it into the music, like for me, that's how you get depth in art. Yeah. Is like, so I think what happens a lot, like a lot of 20th century, mm -hmm. like art music, which is usually what I prefer calling classical music. Sure. Which again, it's like it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to label anything. Um, is so much of the time is spent at the molecular level mm -hmm. that on a phrasing or a structural level, mm -hmm. a lot of times they're very boring. Mm -hmm. It'll be like the whole piece is dissonant and loud. Mm. So like even though there's these incredibly complex mm -hmm. controls that you're doing. Mm -hmm. on the meta level, it's just loud dissonance. Mm -hmm. There's no... So, <laughs> like, for me, it's important for, you know, there are structural differences. Mm -hmm. You know, of like, it was loud and then it was quiet. It mm -hmm. was fast and then it was slow. It was, you know, these mm -hmm. big things. Yeah. 
it's like I love Penderecki's music mm. because it's just those things. Just that. Now he's <laughs> doing it with this incredible like, like there are more individual orchestral parts in his music than anyone else's because every single string player has their own part that they're playing. Mm. But it's like it's like watching a, a movie or reading a book that it's like it has all the structures of this big romantic thing that you know, mm -hmm. but none of the content. Yeah. It's like just mm -hmm. it's just this big loud chord. Yeah. And then a soft chord and then tinkles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like to me that's it works mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think for new music it's mm -hmm. you just make it and you spend the time with it mm -hmm. yeah um, that actually makes me happy about a certain thing is that like I'm really bothered about how much I'm sort of required to be ingesting all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you're doing this thing. So you have to know, like, listen to all Beethoven, Bach and uh, Brahms and everything ever mm -hmm. before you can like do a thing. Right. And I'm, I just, I don't care enough. Like, I don't care enough about those things, at least. Sure. I care a lot about my music, but I just don't care enough about the I'm not trying to do it right. Like, right. I'm just trying to do it right on its own. <laughs> yeah. So I think the um, the creating is not the same as learning about. Sure. So like you don't have to know anything about the past mm. to be able to create original music. Yeah. But if you don't know anything about the past, it's hard to have a conversation with a culture that does know that music. Sure. So for me, it's it's actually one of the like issues with classical music mm -hmm. is um, classical music and jazz and sports and mm -hmm. human endeavors that are difficult. <laughs> require the audience to have enough knowledge of how to do it to know when something difficult happens. Mm -hmm. So like people who have never really played an instrument usually don't enjoy classical music and jazz. Mm -hmm. I'm generalizing here and mm -hmm. I might, I could be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but in my experience, like a big part of classical music mm -hmm. is being like, Oh my God, I can't believe they played that so well. Mm -hmm. Like it is, yeah, yeah. it is, it, a big part of it is actual virtuosity, mm -hmm. which is very much like, it's like watching the Olympics. Yeah. Like you see someone come in and you're like, oh my God, that is incredible. Yeah. But you have to know, you have to have tried to do it yourself at some sure. point yeah. to know that. Mm -hmm. So like most sports fans have played the sport at some point. Mm -hmm. Similarly, most classical music and jazz fans mm -hmm. have played the sport at some point. Mm -hmm. Like, there is some facility with that. Yeah. Because um, it's like, my joke is always with trumpets and playing high Cs and high Ds. Mm. It's like trumpet players will hit like the high note. Same thing with sopranos, right? Mm. They hit this high note. Mm -hmm. If you don't know it's hard to hit high notes, like you've never tried to do it, you're mm. like, I don't care. That's a bad sounding note. Like it doesn't <laughs> sound good. Mm. But if you know, yeah, like I can't hit a high C on trumpet. Mm. So when you hear someone just like, a high C, yeah. you're like, yeah. It's mm. like, it's the same thing as watching someone pole jump. Sure. Like, <laughs> I can't jump that high or that far. Yeah. So seeing someone do it is mm -hmm. impressive. Is that art? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's an interesting... Yeah. Um, getting kind of far afield. What was the original question? Right, well, like, I think... Oh, ingesting. Yeah, yeah, well... I get the gist, like, and I feel, and this doesn't come a whole lot from necessarily academia because actually teachers just go like, oh, this is like this. Yeah. And they go like, this is the thing that you need to listen to. And it's like, all right, cool. And then you just go on your merry way. But like talking to other people, it's like, 
oh yeah, it's like this thing that everyone knows, right? And I I don't know what that is. Sure. So um, <laughs> there's a big thing with uh, I usually term it. Uh, different people have different terms for this, but like a gatekeeper words. Mm. Like, yeah. you're constantly being checked to see if you're one of us. Yeah. Do you know the lingo? <laughs> um, so that's a social thing. Mm -hmm. That's not an artistic thing. Right. Now, it can affect whether your stuff gets played. Mm -hmm. But, like, um, that is more something that is about... And this happens to me all mm. the time. I am <laughs> constantly being evaluated <laughs> to see if I'm actually for real. Mm. It's just a constant thing in the entertainment mm. and art industry. Because there's a lot of people who can talk a good talk, but mm. can't, like, when you're like, cool, you know, like me, I have sent everyone an email about this piece. I haven't <laughs> sent them the piece yet. I'm like, it's going to be great. Mm. I'm going to get them the piece. I've, sure. I've been through this mm -hmm. before, but like, there are three people on this who I've done a bunch of gigs with but I've never played a piece of mine. Mm -hmm. So this will be their only experience with my stuff. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I prove that it's for real, mm -hmm. they're going to view me as a composer. Sure. And they've played like orchestrations of mine at film gigs and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. like <laughs> they've never played one of my pieces. Mm -hmm. And so there is something to like for all you know, like one of my mantras I teach kids is like, mm -hmm. be prepared, be kind, mm -hmm. show up. That's kind yeah. of my like, do those three things, mm -hmm. have a career. But be prepared also involves like, you just have to be amazing <laughs> or at least good. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, if mm -hmm. you're just not good enough, mm -hmm. it's like, then you have to go spend the 10 years in practice. <laughs> um, so like with, something that's a creative act rather mm -hmm. than a performative act. So yeah. like playing music is performative. Mm -hmm. There are like very specific things you can judge people on. Is it in mm -hmm. tune? Are the rhythms correct? Sure. There are like hard things that you can test with people. Yeah. Um, like I know within about 30 seconds of playing with somebody how mm -hmm. good they are. Yeah. It's a cool thing with music. Like, mm -hmm. If you can play, <laughs> everyone knows it very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of like the things I love about it. It's like a sport. Like mm -hmm. if you're better at it, mm -hmm. then like people can try and socially keep you down, but like everybody who actually does it is going to know. They're mm -hmm. going to know that you're <laughs> just good, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so with um, creation arts. So mm -hmm. like writing books, it's product, and I don't mean this in a business sense. Right. It is product based. Mm -hmm. It's not like, I don't convince people I'm good at composing by being like, hey, come watch me use Finale. Check out how <laughs> I entered that chord. It was awesome. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people who are good at like, so for me, it's like I can improv. Mm -hmm. So that's always people are like, how? Oh, wow. Like that is a performative act that is also a creation act. Mm -hmm. But it's scary because the actual creative act of composing or writing something is not like performative in front of other people. Sure. So to prove that you're good at it, you kind of just have to make something mm -hmm. and then put it yeah. out there. So you can teach people, <laughs> you can give people assignments that can help them. You can get better at composing. Mm -hmm. You can get better at the craft of composing. Yeah. You can get better at like hearing mm -hmm. sounds and figuring out how to make them be recreated. Mm -hmm. But the actual the thing is you can sort of teach creativity. Mm -hmm. There is an element of being able to teach creativity. Yeah. But it's very much like cool, if you want to be an author, you should be writing three hours a day. If you mm -hmm. want to be a composer, you should be composing a lot. Mm -hmm. You should be composing more than I do. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like I, I talk about and listen to and write and play and just like mm -hmm. I probably put and teach, mm -hmm. like I'm probably putting 50 to 60 hours a week mm -hmm. for 
at least the last 15 to 20 years mm -hmm. of doing music-y stuff. Yeah. That comes out in my writing. Mm. But I don't get better at writing from doing those things. Mm -hmm. It's just that those influences come out in it. Mm -hmm. So when you're teaching composition, a lot of times those like, go look at this. It's like, I can see you're trying to do something. Mm -hmm. There's a model you can use. Yeah. And you can look at the score and you can hear it and mm -hmm. go like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, but with my notes mm -hmm. or but with this change. Yeah. So that's a way to accomplish that goal. Right. But that doesn't make you better at composing. Right. It makes you better at doing, you know how to do that thing now. Mm -hmm. So it's tough because school is so, mm -hmm. things going into you rather mm -hmm. than things coming out of you. Yeah. Um. So that's something that like, yeah, no, I don't mind being told by a teacher, like, listen to this. You're trying to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Like, great. Uh, what I mind is the expectation of like, well, I don't know, e even in like more contemporary music too. It's, I feel bad whenever people are like, oh, like, for example, like, I've missed David Bowie. I just haven't listened to him. But like, you know, a certain room will gasp. <laughs> <gasps> yeah. And so I'm like, I'm tired of caring anymore. Like, I I like what I like and that's fine. And I'll take my influences wherever I want to wander. But like, I'm tired of feeling shame for stuff that I should have listened to. Sure. <laughs> well, okay, let's talk about this. Um, I'm Quite terrible awesome about four minutes. I'm terrible mm -hmm. about knowing music by other people. Yeah, I'm a very passive music finder. Mm -hmm. um, most of the music I know is because someone has literally like said, "You need to listen to this." Mm -hmm. So that's literally just a confidence thing because people mm -hmm. are always going to do that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say so much. So again, this is, you can do it however you want. I mm -hmm. usually try and turn, if this is something that is, so you cannot control what other people do. It's mm -hmm. one of the great yeah, tragedies yeah. of life. <laughs> You're only in control of how you react to it. Mm -hmm. So my reaction to someone doing that to me mm -hmm. is I go listen to it and see if I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which solves all of the problems. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're rude about it, I just don't, I don't yeah. worry. Like I don't, mm -hmm. it like there's so much music that I know yeah. is cool that I have not listened to. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, Oh my God, you haven't listened to this. Like, why haven't you listened to this? And it's like, I will fit. What should I listen to first? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. instantly like switches the narrative, mm -hmm. like something that was meant. So it's like, you can either feel this, this is hard. It's mm -hmm. not that it's easy to do this. Yeah. But it's like, there's a tendency, and I struggle against this too, and we don't have to end right at no, the no, time. No, no, no. Um, mm -hmm. If someone exposes <laughs> your lack of knowledge mm -hmm. in a public way, <laughs> the natural inclination mm -hmm. is to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm either going to mm. not care what you think, because then mm. it doesn't matter that you said those mean things to me. Mm. Or I, I try and, when I'm sure, dealing sure. with personal things, mm. I try and coach it in kind of infantile terms like that, because <laughs> it makes the whole situation seem ridiculous, because yeah. it usually is. Mm. So, like, okay, you didn't know about David Bowie. Well, he's too old for you to have yeah. known. Like, he just is. Yeah, yeah. Like, those people who were shaming everyone for not knowing who Paul McCartney was with that picture with Kanye, mm -hmm. it's like, why would they know? Mm -hmm. Did you know who the person who yeah, was really yeah. big in 1920s were mm -hmm. when they took a picture? Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, he got to start in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> it's old music now. Yeah. Um. So, like... uh the response is usually 
to defend yourself mm. and shut off the ability to learn. <laughs> like it's, hmm. I'm not going to care what you think. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm not going to listen to it. In fact, I'm not going to listen to anybody. Like this is kind of what I was hearing you say. Like mm. I'm not going to listen to what anyone tells me I should listen to. Right, no. Because I don't want to feel exposed mm. and shamed like that. Yeah, Which people that will this be. this happens sh- that often to me anyways, but it's just like. It happens to me all the yeah. time. <laughs> it's all the time. Mm. Like, people really like proving their superiority. <laughs> like, what I try and do, I again, I am not <laughs> I, presenting myself like I'm this, like, enlightened sure. brain. But if someone doesn't know something, I'm excited to share it. That's why I like being a teacher. Mm. Like, I think it's really funny when teachers get frustrated that students don't know anything. Mm. It's like... Well, if you didn't have a very specialized amount of knowledge that mm. they didn't have, you wouldn't have a gig. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> if everybody knows this stuff, you're no longer a special flower. Mm. So, like, there's a lot of people who get, like, when you get to be an expert at something, mm. you're like, everyone else is stupid. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. you're just really smart. Yeah. You learned a lot about this. Mm. Why would you present it in a negative light? Like you're okay and everyone in the world is stupid. Mm -hmm. Or you've done a lot of work on this so you know a lot Mm -hmm. and other people have done work on other things. Sure. So, cool. You're becoming an expert. Like that is is a byproduct of becoming an expert on something. The Mm -hmm. definition of expert is you know more about it than other people. Sure. So, I try not... And this is very hard Mm because people can be very like... I think we are, and this is a self-defense thing, Mm. I think we're very aware of our ability to be hurt Mm. and vastly underestimate our ability to hurt others. Mm. I think, like, Mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time thinking about how can I avoid getting hurt Mm -hmm. and don't think about, like, how can I avoid hurting other people? Mm -hmm. So to me, if someone's like, I can't believe you haven't heard of this, Mm. I usually try and be like, I totally haven't. Tell me about it. Mm. And it suddenly becomes, I mean, for one thing, Mm -hmm. there's usually a chance that they don't really know that much about anyway. Sure. People like saying that statement the second they've learned something. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the ultimate student thing to do. Of Mm -hmm. like, you go to other students, you're like, you didn't know about this. And it's like, I taught that to you like three days ago. (laughs) Like you three days ago. You would have been mean to yourself three days ago for mm-hmm. not knowing this thing. Like, <laughs> that's that's not cool. Yeah, Don't do that. But people like doing it. Mm. Um, so I just try and flip the narrative of like, mm. I'm... So if you go like, I don't care. Like, mm. I don't care what you all think. Because it hurts me when I care. Mm. You are shutting yourself off from being able to learn more. Mm. And like, that doesn't hurt them. Mm-hmm. Not that you should hurt them. <laughs> but like it doesn't hurt them at all that only mm. hurts you yeah so i always just take it as like oh this is an opportunity to learn something new oh mm-hmm. this is like sure i it's like there's a lot of truth to this so like all those like buddhist sayings <laughs> about like how to reach that next level of mm-hmm. existence there's this kind of assumption like i think there's this Maybe this is maybe this is just me misunderstanding it when I was younger, <laughs> but I always felt like there's this assumption that somehow like you don't care, mm-hmm. like that is Buddhism. It's like <laughs> you know you are neutral, mm. and to me it's like no, like mm. they the point is to care about everything, mm-hmm. and the point is to also be intentional about what you do. Mm. So, like, if you feel something, Mm -hmm. you know, someone makes you feel shamed about not knowing something. Mm -hmm. Story of humanity. (laughs) Story of academia. Mm -hmm. Believe me, academia (laughs) is like half the questions at conferences are not questions. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, you didn't address the uh, fact that I wrote all of my last few papers on that only I know about the details mm-hmm. and I'm going to make you look like you don't know anything because you didn't mention it in your paper and mm-hmm. I'm going to make a statement. And then you go like, mm-hmm. so was there a question or are you just 
being mean in the public. <laughs> like, I don't know what. what sure. It, it's like a trope in academia. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so it's a trope with students, too. Mm. And I, I think some of that is learned from professors. Mm. Um, so to me, it's like the people who are really great creators and mm. lifelong learners just don't treasure knowing something. Mm. Like they don't treasure the idea of like, I know this and therefore I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to like, mm-hmm. and I don't want other people to know it. Mm. And if someone else knows more than me, that's, but it's just like, it's kind of that, like, if I assume I don't know anything, then mm. I am open to learning. Like they call it, so the, the Buddhism mm. translation, westernized <laughs> bastardization of it is like the child's mind. Mm. And it's the idea that like children are really good at learning mm. because they're in the child mind state of mm. they don't assume they already know it mm. and they don't feel any shame for not knowing it. Mm. And it's not that they actually learn, like there's a few things like language and stuff like that. But like I have taught adult violence students and kid violence students Mm -hmm. and everyone always assumes adult violence students are slower. No, adult Mm -hmm. violins learn tremendous, like six-year-olds just start doing cartwheels in the middle of your floor for like half the lesson. Mm -hmm. They're not getting better at violin while they're doing that. (laughs) They play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for like two years before they can play anything else. Mm -hmm. The difference between adult learners and child learners is that Mm -hmm. adult learners feel shame about the fact they don't know it. And so they get really frustrated about learning Mm -hmm. and they feel like I should be better. Mm -hmm. But like the mental state of feeling like you should know something Mm -hmm. doesn't make you know it or learn it. It just (laughs) makes you feel bad. And then you tend not to learn it. Yeah. So like it's a real like, Mm -hmm. like mental cancer Mm. to feel shame about not knowing things Mm. because it is the like number one way you can make sure you don't learn new stuff (laughs) um like for me when i first got my gig here Mm. when i first started teaching so like 2013 was Mm. when i first started teaching college like i was a ta before that so i taught college for Mm. three years but like even that the second you're in a role Mm -hmm. there's an expectation that Mm. you're a certain amount of good. Yeah. I knew I was good enough at violin, Mm. at least compared to students. Mm. I knew I was good enough at enough aspects of production. Mm -hmm. But compositionally, I felt very like, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing. And suddenly I'm supposed to like, you know, and I'm presenting myself as this like, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) everyone wants to be a world-renowned something, right? So you're like, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm world-renowned because I don't like, Mm -hmm. I have a tendency to do this, but I'm very careful because I hate it when other people do it, Mm. to talk yourself up higher than you are. Mm -hmm. So my joke with world-renowned is if you're going to write world-renowned in your bio, I better already know who you are. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) if your bio says you're a world-renowned something and Mm -hmm. I've never heard of you, then (laughs) literally your renown has not reached this part of the world. Yes. Um, but like that is the, that feeling of shame is what keeps you from being creative. Number one thing that keeps you from being creative mm. is shame. So Dustin posted an article about this. Mm. Did you read it? It was specifically yeah. about shame. <laughs> I think it'd be really good mm. for you to read. So it's specifically about like mm. feeling shame about the art you make mm-hmm. and how that keeps you from making art yeah um i really think like shame is at the core because it's like Mm -hmm. the reason it's so easy as a kid to make art is because you're not like you haven't been hurt yet yeah you haven't like (laughs) shown someone your butterfly and they go like that looks stupid then you go like oh my god i'm never gonna draw another butterfly you Mm -hmm. know it's the same thing sure um so to me it's like I mean, I feel the same thing. I'm yeah. worried. I'm worried about putting this piece in front of like these are like one of them is my former teacher from grad school. Mm. He is the best violinist in Oklahoma, like yeah. hands down. He's an incredible player. Like the other two string players are like they're all people who I've played with, and I mm. go like I treasure the fact that I'm the worst musician in the room right now. Mm. Like it's awesome, and it's <laughs> like 
admitting that is real hard. Mm -hmm. But like, it's like, I don't know. I feel like it'd be very lonely to be the best person at something. Mm. So like, I want to strive to be the best person, but like, I'm also a big extrovert. So I kind of want buddies <laughs> along the way. Um, and like, if there's no one who's better than you at something, then like, there's no guidelines for how to get better. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why it's so like, hmm. the people who really come up with like new ideas, like the Einsteins and stuff mm -hmm. are often like, spend years trying to come up with it mm. and it's just that one next step mm -hmm. because there's no like guideline of yeah you know mm. like cre i think people being creative is highly <laughs> both underrated and overrated mm -hmm. like i think yeah it's underrated and that like creativity is really important and it can be cultivated mm -hmm. um it's like for me working on a piece it's like some of the stuff I figure out, I like put it on like back end processors. Mm -hmm. It's like I have to be working on the piece at least like three or four hours a day because mm -hmm. then it'll just like run as a background task in my head. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, how am I going to do that? <laughs> yeah. And you come back to it, it's like, ah, yeah. Okay. It's why like walks, showers, mm -hmm. like people, walks have been a thing for artists for forever. You yeah. get stuck, you go on a walk. Because mm -hmm. it's like when you just sit there, it's like there's not something. There's too yeah. much focus. Do something. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, does that help? Mm. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the <laughs> same way that like, what's the Dune quote? Like, fear is the little death. Fear is the mind killer. Mm. Like, have you read Dune? No, it, it's on shame. My list. <laughs> shame. No, it, it, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but it like, is on my and, list, though, actually, <laughs> and I just kind of made you feel bad by asking if you <laughs> had read Dune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like it. Yeah, it it's a cool. It's a weird. Yeah, it's the kind of fantasy book I like. Mm -hmm. Sci-fi. It's fantasy. Yeah. Um, it's got like a mood and vibe. Yeah, yeah. Like you read it, and it's just like vibey. Mm -hmm. Always feels a little 70s to me. Mm. Like, it's just got this vibe that I like <laughs> yeah. about it. Um, but they have this mantra that it's like, mm. fear is the mind killer. Like, mm. fear, every time you're afraid, it's the little death. And the whole idea of it is like, it's a really artsy-fartsy way of saying like, when you're afraid of something, mm. you either freeze or you make decisions based on that fear. Rather mm. than on like, this is what I think will do things mm. better. Shame is the like art version of yeah, that. Yeah. It's like I feel shame about this piece. Mm -hmm. Um well then you're not gonna show it to anybody. Yeah. You're not gonna work on it. Mm -hmm. You're gonna feel bad about it. And it's just like all art sucks at some part of the process. <laughs> like it really does. Yeah. I mean, like, there are still parts of my piece that I'm supposed to have done tomorrow mm -hmm. and I will be going to immediately after this. Yes. That suck. Mm -hmm. There's a couple transitions that totally suck. Mm -hmm. I would be very shameful mm -hmm. if I sent it out to people. Sure. But like, that's not helpful. Yeah. What's helpful is to be like, okay, how can I fix it? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm <laughs> ashamed of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say like, that's the, mm -hmm. shame is like the learning <laughs> killer. Shame is the art destroyer. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's, so the cool thing, so we kind of talked earlier about forgiveness mm. is more about you than it is about the person you're yeah, forgiving. Yeah. Like you are releasing the, there was a um, LGBTQ pastor mm. and she was talking about um, forgiveness mm -hmm. as like the strongest thing you can do. Because mm -hmm. you're saying, I'm taking this thing you've done to me and taking that weight off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that, like the for me, the only way I get rid of anger at somebody mm -hmm. or something is to forgive mm -hmm. it for happening. Yeah. So with shame, you control, so like it's hard. It's, mm -hmm. You're trying to do this kind of Buddhist thing of like intentionally feeling things. Yeah. But like you're the one that mm -hmm. feels ashamed. Mm -hmm. I cannot make you feel ashamed. Mm-hmm. I can try and manipulate you yeah, into feeling yeah. ashamed, but like I can't, mm -hmm. that is your feeling. Mm -hmm. So 
if you can practice not feeling shame yeah when and like a lot of it's naming it like mm-hmm. i really believe in like you mm-hmm. name a feeling like and then you can control it yeah so like i would practice because it's going to happen so the mm-hmm. next time someone like me goes <laughs> like have you read dune no <sighs> no it's like i thought you thick. liked books <laughs> you know I mean, dude, there's so many books I haven't read. Yeah. I have done a very <laughs> cursory glance <laughs> of literature. Um, like extremely <laughs> cursory. I I do not read I do not read nearly as much as I want to. Mm-hmm. Like I maybe read like audiobooks are the best. Audiobooks are cool. I really love physical books. Mm. But like I I just don't read. I used to right. read all the time. Mm-hmm. And now it's like maybe five to ten books a year maybe mm. maybe <laughs> because i'm on a podcast i'm saying that you know right, what i mean right. well i have a bookshelf full of books i haven't read so right yeah. do you feel shame when you look at them no good because <laughs> that's not going to make you want to read them no it makes me go i'll do that eventually yeah <laughs> um so like you have to practice feeling certain ways mm. in situations so i would practice like Next time someone does like a knowledge power play. Yeah. You don't know, blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah. It's like, yeah, man, I'm a student. I'm literally here to learn things I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't react. Mm -hmm. Like, take a sec Mm -hmm. and be like, well, what am I feeling right now? I'm feeling kind of ashamed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose not to feel that way. Whether or not it's effective, just go like, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to feel shame about that. Sure. And then, like, you get better. It takes a long time. I used to get so nervous for performances. And it Mm -hmm. still happens. But I just did it enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what? It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's okay. You know what? It's okay. I'm lucky enough, like, it worked, you know. Um, So I think in a weird way, it's like, you can practice being mentally healthy about situations. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I used to have so much trouble doing, uh, any sort of like conflict. Mm -hmm. I was very conflict avoidant Mm -hmm. and like, you know, with students, with colleagues, with, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and being an administrator role is like, <laughs> if you are conflict avoidant, you're going to have problems. Yeah. Like it's a, it's an issue. Um, and so I've learned not to be, mm-hmm. and it is a learned thing. And mm-hmm. I am different now. And I mm-hmm. bet my brain chemistry of how I like interact in those situations is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that for me made that difference is I went, like, I'm not going to feel bad about telling someone something they don't want to hear because mm-hmm. we've already done the deed. Whatever the deed is that mm-hmm. you need to have the awkward meeting with, mm-hmm. the time to feel bad was when you were making the decision. Yeah. And so that's when you try. Again, it's like if you don't do the wrong thing, you don't feel guilt about it, and then you yeah. don't feel anxiety about it because you don't feel guilt about it, <laughs> and you don't feel ashamed about it. You know, like... Mm-hmm. um. So to me, it's, I don't know. I really feel like shame comes from like, I mean, there are some terrible people out there who will make people feel ashamed of themselves. Mm. They themselves are probably not terrible people other than in that situation. Mm. But like other people can get you down. Mm. But you can control how you react to it. Mm or at least try to. Mm -hmm. And I think like that is, it is amazingly powerful. And Mm -hmm. I've had like really good relationships with people Mm -hmm. who like in the first month of me working with them have done something that like (laughs) has been unbelievably rude Mm -hmm. or hurtful or something that should have ruined my relationship with Mm -hmm. them. And I will Mm -hmm. usually like, you also, you know, 
fool me once, shame on you, <laughs> fool me twice. So like, you still need to be cognizant of like, hey, if they've done this before, maybe don't like ask for it. Mm -hmm. But like, I've had people who I've forgiven for like doing really hurtful things to me. Mm -hmm. And then like, we have this great relationship at the end. And yeah. like, I'm still aware that thing happened, mm -hmm. but it's not a weight on me. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, like, there's a lot of people who will lash out because whatever their reason is, like, it's not about mm. you. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, it's about, they're doing, they're going through something. Yeah, that's that's actually been a, a mantra I've been telling myself lately. It's like, that thing wasn't because of me. Like, it usually is something right. that they're going through. Now, I will say, the flip side of that mm -hmm. is to make sure it wasn't you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't I don't let myself feel not guilty about stuff until I've done a very thorough examination <laughs> of like is there something I could have done better should I apologize mm -hmm. should, I mean like I have like apology mm. like I will say I'm sorry yeah. for anything Well no oh, also what I meant is like if someone you know honks at you very angrily in traffic or something right. that's a situation where it's like I I mean yeah you can go did I do anything no Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. I, I had a guy the other yeah. day, like, <laughs> both hands just like flipping me off, just like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Okay. You're having a bad day. You're having a very bad day. <laughs> um, also, like, is it worth the chance that you have a shotgun in your back? Right. For me to flip you off? Because, mm -hmm. so you just, no, it's not. Forgive them. We're in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so, one of the things <laughs> I like doing with that, and this makes me feel very good and like a Buddhist monk <laughs> is like doing a nice thing when someone does something mean to mm -hmm. you. So like if someone honks at me in traffic, you just try and stop and like let someone go in front of me or something. Mm -hmm. And it like, it feels so good. It's mm -hmm. like you put this negative energy onto me mm -hmm. and then I turned it into yeah. positive energy <laughs> and gave it to someone and like the net happiness of the world. Yeah, I'm on the side of whatever. <laughs> sure. Um, it feels good. Yeah. And like for me, that's the, like when people talk about, you know, um, pacifist resistance mm -hmm. and like positive resistance, it doesn't mean you're not strong. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you don't hold your ground. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're not all of those things. Yeah. But like you don't want to play if there is a structure in place, this is why like revolutionaries make the worst government people. Because <laughs> a lot of times in order to be a revolutionary, you have to be incredibly violent mm -hmm. and authoritarian and you have to do things in secret. Mm -hmm. And there are all these things that you had to do in order to overthrow the government. Mm -hmm. So then when you become the government, like all of those things are the worst things for yes. a government to be, <laughs> even though they were very effective for you to overthrow the government. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it's like that, there's a lot of truth in all of those like sayings, but like you tend to become the enemy. Mm -hmm. Like I don't remember what the actual quote is, but it's essentially uh there's that quote from Batman. <laughs> What's that one? <laughs> uh you either uh live long enough to or you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Oh, right. <laughs> so that's not quite what I mean. No, I know, but it's similar. <laughs> that's a little bit more, you know, nihilistic. Um <laughs> But it's like if you – like if someone says something mean to you and then you say something mean back to them, mm -hmm. you did not fix the problem. You just became a mean person. Yeah. You didn't make it so they're going to not say something mean mm -hmm. back. So it's like – I don't know. There's something very powerful when someone says something mean to you. Mm -hmm. To be like, you know, that was really hurtful. Mm -hmm. Like – that makes me feel bad. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I did something. Yeah. That elicited that. Mm -hmm. You want to watch someone's stomach drop. <laughs> you do that to them when they do something mean. Yeah. And not like that was really hurtful. Not aggressive. Mm -hmm. Not <laughs> nothing comf like mm. diffusing confrontation mm -hmm. with like kindness and honesty mm -hmm. is very effective. Yeah. And it's weird. <laughs> Um, cause it's, dude, it, I'm, <laughs> I'm a 
red-blooded man. <laughs> like, I also have testosterone mm. and the tendency to see red. Mm. And so, like, I got in a lot of fights when I was four. Hmm. I got kicked out of preschool. I got kicked out of two daycare centers. <laughs> because I had this, like, real obsession with, like, things the truth matters. Mm -hmm. So I had two situations where like <laughs> this person who I viewed them as a bully, one of them was a bully. Looking back, the other one, we just didn't get along. <laughs> and there's one situation where the guy pushed me and I got him with a really great right hook right as the like <laughs> teacher was coming down. It was, or the, the babysitter. Mm. Uh, he was like in a bigger weight class than the rest of us mm -hmm. and he was her nephew and she mm. saw me punch him. <laughs> and we had this conversation. She was like, I saw you punch him. And I was like, he like started it. Mm. I was the kid. It was like, he started it. Mm. Like he pushed me and then I punched him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like he started it. And she was like, no, he did it. And I was like, if you want me to lie, I will lie to you. Mm. But that's what happened. <laughs> and I was told that you're not supposed to lie. So... <laughs> You know, I was like, yeah. you are asking me to lie, and I refuse to lie. Mm. You know, like, it was a very confrontational four-year-old. <laughs> um, but it's like, that was my, mm. that's how I thought to react to those things. Like, someone punches you, punch it back. Mm -hmm. Why? It's the right thing to do. Well, I got in trouble every time. It was yeah. always me that got in trouble. Because <laughs> I don't think I had an understanding of, like, if they push you, you're not supposed to punch them as hard as you can. <laughs> yeah um and so like the last time i had a physical altercation i was four years old sure it's good <laughs> i got it out of my system young but like i kind of had this realization that like oh when you do that mm -hmm. it doesn't like it doesn't fix the problem mm -hmm. um so it's an interesting mm -hmm. you know it's like reacting to violence with violence doesn't mm -hmm. stop it yeah and so that's a strong ethic of mine. <laughs> yeah. And so reacting like, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to like have just to let just it happen. take it. Yeah. So like with the shame thing, like mm -hmm. don't like be nice to yourself. Don't mm -hmm. figure out a way not to feel the shame about it. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of it, it really is like, if you can stop worrying about being good mm -hmm. and just be like interested in doing the next thing, like if you can stop, because I had this very, it was very, I think it was rooted in shame. I mean, like almost everybody who becomes a professor goes through like mm -hmm. a period of uh, imposter syndrome mm -hmm. with at least some aspect of mm -hmm. what they do. Because it, it's just, yeah, you spend all this time as a student yeah, and then suddenly it's the flip. Mm -hmm. Well, also I'm like, on the the transition into becoming a professional whatever right and so it's like i'm looking for jobs and so i have to be good enough for that job right and so i'm not so <laughs> well it's hard i mean like it's so again there's that thing of like do you feel shame of like, I'm not good enough and I was supposed to be at this point? Like there's this like total, right, right, right. there's a very shame thing with especially, I don't want to say especially there's with everything that it's yeah, like, yeah. there's some sort of like the mm. rat race, yeah, you know, yeah. and like I'm. There's some Japanese kid that's better at guitar than I am and they're like 16 or something. I'm right. Like, yeah. Well, well, I'm a violinist. So yeah. there's a Japanese kid who yeah. is two. Yes. Who is better at violin than <laughs> I am. Um like, if you feel shame about it, then it's like, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. It's debilitating. Mm -hmm. But if you go like, hey, there's this. So I always think of it in like, you can always see like the next two levels above you. Mm -hmm. Like you've got enough skill <laughs> at the thing you're doing to like, you know what's the stuff around you. Mm -hmm. You can hear the stuff as I smack the mic. <laughs> that's better than you. Mm -hmm. You can recognize the stuff that's like an expert. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, a really interesting thing is like I can tell the difference mm -hmm. now between 
the skill levels of the best violinists in the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I could until like the last three or four years. Mm. Like <laughs> they all sounded like pretty yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. And now I'll listen to stuff and I'm like, that's, I think that's better. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can hear it now. I can mm -hmm. hear these things now. Yeah. And so like, that's a, that's cool for me to be like, you know what? I can finally hear what it, I don't know if I can do it, but I mm -hmm. can hear what yeah. that, that top, top mm -hmm. end is. Okay. So how do I get there? Mm -hmm. You know, like that's the, yeah. how do I get to that mm -hmm. spot? Like I can read orchestral scores better now that I've written. Mm -hmm. Like I think I've maybe written six or seven things for like orchestra or orchestra sized things mm -hmm. in the last four or five years. And like I can read scores now because I've mm -hmm. done it. So yeah. like I know what you're doing mm -hmm. in a way that like <laughs> studying scores would not let me learn. Mm -hmm. um, even though you still need to study them, it's like the doing and then going back and seeing, going, oh, okay. Like, yeah. I get it. Like, I get what you're doing. Um, that's like, so I actually joke mm. that because I'm doing very well in my career for my age. <laughs> I'm having a great, mm. I'm on a great ride. I'm just hoping <laughs> keeps moving forward. Sure. Um, and so like, I was never the best violinist at the studio at OU. Mm -hmm. There's always someone who was like, Mm -hmm. just uh, I was always like second or third you mm -hmm. know like I'm I'm up there mm -hmm. you know but there was someone who just like just practice more or maybe they were just more innately talented or they spent the time in high school mm -hmm. you know whatever it was so I was kind of like upper middle of the pack which is a really good spot to be in a learning environment mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of people that I've met who like will be like when did you get good? Mm. And I'm like, dude, we've been out of school for like closer to a decade than not. Like yeah. I kept getting better. Yeah. Like I didn't stop at 25 yeah. and go like, okay, this is it. <laughs> and it's really hard to do because suddenly mm -hmm. you don't have the structure of the school. Mm -hmm. You don't have the like structure of people giving you opportunities mm -hmm. to grow. Yeah. You have to make it yourself. Um, so it's interesting because it's like for me, I uh, like I don't talk about this that much with other people, mm. but like I have my own warm up routine on violin mm. that I've edited and tweaked and changed. Mm -hmm. Like every year, I add something to it or take it away, mm -hmm. and it's like I don't get to practice as much as I want. But like I do, I have kept thinking mm -hmm. about it and performing, and like yeah. every time I perform. So I made this decision. It was really hard here. I always felt like because I wasn't a professor, because I was administration, like I always had to be on my phone because like mm. if stuff happens, yeah. like you get like everybody's crisis goes to you. So it's mm -hmm. like every professor will have like one crisis a year. Yeah. You have to deal with everybody's. You don't <laughs> have to deal with the full brunt of it, but like, yeah, it's going to touch you. Mm -hmm. So I would be at these gigs and I'd be like checking my email and <laughs> like it'd just be like it was really it was really stressful. Mm -hmm. And I kind of made this decision that's like okay it has been proven over and over again I can't do two things at once. Mm -hmm. If there is a television on <laughs> I cannot do anything but focus on the television mm -hmm. like I am ooh pretty lights. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to try whatever I'm doing mm -hmm. I'm doing that 100%. Yeah. And it totally changed, mm -hmm. like, if I'm at a gig. So there's a sense of, like, you know, you're doing, oh, this isn't a fun gig. You know, mm -hmm. like, I have a gig on Saturday, and it's, like, at a church, and it's two concerts, and we have to be there at one, and it's an Ada, and I'm going to be there from one until nine, and I get <laughs> back, and it pays well. But it's, like, it would be very easy for me to be, like, Ugh. Sure. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. Ugh. <laughs> you know, and instead it's like, okay, if I'm playing the violin, I'm going to try mm -hmm. and play the violin as well as I can. Yeah. And like practice doing it as well mm -hmm. as I can. Yeah. And that is a very vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of artists don't, 
they, so I used to do this all the time, mm. all the time. I used to always be like, so I'm not the best violinist, but I practice a whole lot less. Mm-hmm. Like I'm really busy. I practice less. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, I could Fine. beat you. I could beat you if I practiced more, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I just, you know, I don't have time to do it. <laughs> That's not mm-hmm. helpful. Yeah. And so like, I've really done a switch where it's like, this is just where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as where I could be. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, like there are goals. Yeah. But there's no like. It's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee because you still have to do the thing. Yeah. Um. So it's an interesting like. That was a real switch for me. Mm-hmm. And I think that was like why I've kept getting better at things. Yeah. Because I stopped being like <laughs> afraid to give it my all. Mm-hmm. Like, I used to really like, oh, I didn't win the audition because like I didn't really prepare for it. Like I would give, mm-hmm. you give yourself outs. Yeah. You give yourself outs and you do it on purpose and mm-hmm. it is totally self-sabotaging <laughs> because you don't want, because like the most shame-filled sucky thing to happen to anybody mm-hmm. is I tried my hardest and it wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. Like that is soul crushing. Yeah. Welcome to being an artist. Mm-hmm. If you can lean into that, mm-hmm. it stops being quite so soul crushing after. It's not as scary as you think. Mm-hmm. Weirdly enough, like realizing your best just isn't good enough yet. Hmm isn't that bad after repeated like smacks to the <laughs> ego Fair the enough. first few times sucks mm-hmm. um but it's like with this piece there is a shape and we'll wrap up soon so i yeah. can go do it but like <laughs> there is a shape of what the piece could be mm-hmm. and i'm like i will be so mad at myself if there is like a transition or a part that mm-hmm. like isn't what i want it to be because I decided two weeks ago that I was going to take Saturday off or mm-hmm. like I watched the show or I did like I didn't mm-hmm. give it my all. Yeah. That's going to bug me more mm-hmm. than if I try my best and I'm still not happy with it. Yeah. Because then you just go like, oh, that, well, that was the best. I, that literally is if it was literally the best you could do. Yeah. Then it's not about you. Yeah. And so winning stuff is not about you. Yeah. Winning things is luck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you have to do well enough to be in the running, but it's just luck at that point. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I think that is a really, if you can get that. Mm-hmm. It's like we were discussing it the other day, like, okay, like, you're at the start. Yeah. Now you need to keep getting better. Yeah. So, like, like for us, it's if we hadn't done all the stuff that we did not feel prepared to do, that we know we didn't do exactly <laughs> right, then like, like it was so cool when we did our first like professional film scoring session. Mm-hmm. Like, we had done we had done stuff before. We'd done film scoring. We'd done stuff, but like actually like in a big studio mm-hmm. with like a full orchestra, mm-hmm. and we did the parts. And we're like Christina's conducting, and I'm concert master, mm-hmm. and we contracted it, and like it ran like butter, mm-hmm. and it was just like, oh my god, we know how to do this. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Yeah, but it's because we'd spent yeah the entirety of our lives mm-hmm. getting better at stuff mm-hmm. that then like, oh, do you need like. When you get the opportunity, you go like, I actually do know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. It's such a good feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's like that comes from not like, it's just over and over again, Mm -hmm. doing your best and feeling very vulnerable about like it is, that Mm -hmm. was a huge problem of mine. Like that, Mm -hmm. I always gave myself an out. (laughs) And I always, I had this thing of like, so I always double majored between violin and composition. Mm. So like if something went crappy on violin, I'd be like, well, I'm more of a composer anyway. If something <laughs> went bad on composition, I was like, well, I'm more of a violinist yeah. anyway. Like I would totally like, mm-hmm. oh, you hurt me. I'm going to go over to the other one. Yeah. Oh, you hurt me. I'm going to go over to the other one. <laughs> Which like, 
maybe it wasn't bad as a survival instinct for sure. college because it's pretty rough. Mm. But like, now it's like, okay, I'm me. Did I do my best on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Does that help? Yes. No. Every, everything. Thank you. <laughs> um, once again, plug your stuff. Oh, okay. I was really bad about this last time. <laughs> so I'm actually going to plug our stuff. Okay. Um, so we're doing a recording um, of a clarinet quartet, but there's also a clarinet quintet. Mm. Uh, there's a quartet that I've written, um, and there's an octet that I'm currently sending out parts mm. to people. Uh, that's a nice way of saying it. I haven't sent out parts yet. <laughs> Um, we're going to be recording it January 2nd. Mm. Uh, the ensemble is called Devil Sticks mm. because clarinets on the 12th century listing mm-hmm. of which instruments are demonic and which are angelic. Double reeds are like way on the hell side mm. rather than the heaven side. Brass instruments are great. They're, oh, yeah. they're, they're the heaven ones because angels play angels them. Angels play trumpet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so we're doing that. We've got a concerto coming up that's a double concerto that christine and i will be playing with the fort smith symphony that'll be in may Mm. um we're doing a read through at the end of january with the oklahoma city uh university orchestra jeffrey who's going to be conducting Mm. the octet is the conductor that is going to let me do a read and so that is called wub 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 and it's um a duo concerto for violin clarinet and orchestra that emulates electronic music moves Mm -hmm. acoustically yeah. So there's some panning. I'm trying to do a side chain compression thing with the bass drum <laughs> that like makes the orchestra sound like it's side chain compression. Oh, man. Um, yeah. And it's fun. It's yeah. like, it's supposed to be a fun piece. I think concertos mm-hmm. are supposed to be cool and yeah. showy and all of those things. Yeah. Um, so we've got that. We're doing a uh, arrangement that we're working with the Oklahoma City Philharmonic mm-hmm. about, I can't say too much about it yet, but yeah. Um, <laughs> That's really exciting. And that's going to really highlight some incredible Native American musicians. Cool. Christina's working on the thing, uh, mm-hmm. the Jack Kilpatrick stuff. So mm-hmm. you're going to hear stuff about that soon. Um, they're creating like an archive and they're doing writing on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think we've got a film coming up. I mm-hmm. have not been told. Films are funny. You don't you don't get told the name of the film. Yeah. Like I've been told there's a date yeah. and it's for sure happening. And that's it. Yeah. Um, Both so, of the films that I've worked on, I had to ask for a title so that I could save it correctly. Right. <laughs> um, so I think that's basically our next seven or eight months, mm. um, which is exciting. It's planned out. It's yeah. happening. Um, and it's really exciting for us to be working on our music. We've done a lot of time the last four, four or five years of like helping produce other people's music and work mm-hmm. on their music and work on these projects. And now we're really pushing our own music. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun. I think I yeah. think that might be all of my plugs. I hope that's all I have to do. <laughs> Are there any questions about it? Patrick Con- Conlon Music? Dot com. Yep. Cool. Yep. There's the email address on there. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm on Facebook yeah. and Instagram too. I'm old, so I'm finally learning how to use Instagram. <laughs> I have like eight posts. Most yeah. are of my cat. That's fine. I love your cat. She's a good cat. <laughs> um Well, yeah. I'm Santiago Ramones. Patrick Conlon. You can find everything that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com. You can download Songs with Words demo for free or for however money you want to pay. You can download this podcast on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, on Stitcher, and Google Play, and all of the other places, I think. I always end my podcast with my three things. They shape my my life philosophy. Those three things are love never fails, it's going to be okay, I might be wrong.